Welcome, Solo Thank Becker. Thank you. So um, again, uh, I'm really glad to be here this morning. Let me uh, explain a little bit about what I'm going to do. So obviously in many families where there is illness or disability, as you well know, it is family members that provide the bulk of care. Um, uh, and in some of those families, um, it will be uh, children that will provide that care. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, so what I want to do in the next half an hour is to outline what are the main research findings from 30 years of research that I've been doing on young carers. And I've, if you like, summarized those under five big headings, which you will see in the presentation, five headings in which I will then present you evidence about those research findings. And then the sixth part of my presentation is if you like an attempt to um, show you uh, some of the concepts that we have developed about young carers over the last 30 years to give you some sense of um, why they become carers um, and what is our mission in terms of supporting them. So I, I'm going to move from research evidence to trying to show you um, some, some key concepts that I think help explain uh, why some children become young carers and what we need to do uh, about it. So let me start <clears throat> by defining our terms. Um, and this is a definition I wrote a long, long time ago um, for a, an encyclopedia of social work. And when we're talking about young carers, we are talking about children, children and young people under the age of 18. So they have the legal status of being children and they're providing care, assistance or support to another family member. Um, on a regular basis. And that person who is receiving care is most often a parent. And I'll talk about that today, uh, but it could be a, 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 a sibling, a grandparent or any other relative who has a need for care, who's disabled, has some chronic illness, mental health problem or um, addiction problem um, or anything indeed connected with a need for care, support or supervision. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I'm talking about young carers, I'm talking about children under the age of 18. And in the UK and now in many other countries, we have a, another phrase for young people aged 18 to 24. And we call those people young adult carers. Um, and the definition is the same. They are doing the same kind of tasks as children. They're just in an older age group, and so they have the legal status of being adults, which in some countries changes their relationship um, with the state and with formal health and social care services. So young carers are under the age of 18 and young adult carers 18 to 24, and I'll talk about both groups this morning. In 1992, <clears throat> 30 years ago, when I started researching around young carers, um, there was really no knowledge about this group at all. They were very much hidden. Um, they lived to a large extent secret lives. And so they were invisible to researchers, to academics and scholars, to policymakers, um, and to professionals. Um, so we really had no knowledge about young carers 30 years ago. Um, there was little public or professional awareness in the UK and most other countries. There was no law, no rights or entitlements and very few services that were directed um, at them. So what we found 30 years ago was that this was an invisible group of children um, and um, whose voices were seldom heard. Um, I was a young carer in my own childhood, um, caring for a grandparent who had Parkinson's disease. And I started caring at the age of 12, and I cared through till around about 24, 25 
when my grandma passed away. Um, so, and e even in those days, so we're talking about the 1970s, um, we, there was no knowledge of young carers and I didn't even know uh, then that I was a young carer. I thought that everything I was doing was fairly um, regular. I didn't realize that it was out of the ordinary. Um, and that was the, that was the experience of most young carers and still is the experience of I would think the majority of young carers um, in advanced countries um, do not identify themselves as young carers and may not think that what they're doing is, uh, is, um, is different to what other children are doing. <clears throat> so since the, uh, since the 1990s when I started doing this research, um, I've, done, I've worked on over 50 research projects um, and we've published a few hundred um, papers and articles and, and books, and this is just a selection. The first study I did, interestingly, I don't know if my mouse is showing on the screen, but is this study in the top left-hand corner called Children Who Care. And it was a study, it was called Children Who Care Inside the World of Young Carers. And it was the first study of young carers trying to expose um, what was going on in a small sample. It was a dozen children um, in one city. Um, and that really started this whole program of work um, on young carers because it told the stories of their lives and showed the, what the experience of caring was on their development, on their education and, uh, and so on. And since then I've been very fortunate to work on um, a, a, a wide range of research projects. <clears throat> so let me now go into the five big areas of research findings. And the first one that I want to show you some evidence for is that there are far more young carers um, in a particular country or in the world, I suppose, than their parents would disclose. Um, because most um, serve, most studies that are official government studies rely on census data and that is completed by the adult or the parent and that the figures for the number of young carers seriously underestimate um, the true extent of caring and that a significant proportion of young carers are very young people so let me show you the evidence for this set of research findings so the first piece of evidence I want to show you is the findings from the 2001 and 2011 United Kingdom census. And this has also been done in 2021, but the figures are not yet available. But you can see here from these two national census that um, we ask a question in our census, which is, is there someone in your family who provides help um, or care to another family member because of illness, disability, and so on. And the adult in the house, the householder, completes the census and must disclose whether there is a carer. And then they must disclose what the age of the carer is. And then they must disclose how many hours of caring that person is providing. So again, this is very much focused on what the adult or the parent is actually willing to disclose to the state about who is a carer in their family or whether there is a carer in their family. And in the 2001 census, you can see that 149,000 children um, were identified by parents in England and Wales. And that figure rose to 177,000 in the 2011 census. And I suspect it will have gone up in the 2021 census, but as I say, we do not have the figures. So the increase between the two census dates is 19%. That's the proportion of children um, who are, have been identified by parents as young carers has gone up by 90%. But actually you can see that the biggest increase is in the age group five, six, and seven, where the number has has risen by 83% and eight and nine where the number has risen by 55%. So 
So our census, as disclosed by adults, indicates that there are children as young as five who are providing care in their families. And it goes from five to 17. And we have a profile of the numbers of children who are caring. Now this proportion, 177,000, is approximately 2.3% of all children. Um, so for, the, for our purposes today, the UK census indicates that between two and 3% of all children are young carers, and that many of them are young or of primary school age. Now, I have always worried that if you ask parents to disclose to the state whether their child is a carer, that will underestimate the true extent of caring by children. So in 2010 and in 2018, I conducted a survey um, through the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. And we asked, instead of parents, whether their child was a carer, we asked children directly whether they provided care in their families. And we used a psychometric instrument called the MACA. And the MACA stands for the Multidimensional Assessment of Caring Activities. And it's an 18 item self-report instrument, which asks children whether they do any tasks, certain tasks, and it asks them to tell us whether they never do them, whether they do them some of the time, or whether they do them a lot of the time. And from that, we're able to determine whether a child is a young carer, and we're also able to determine the kinds of tasks they do. This is a validated instrument, which is now used in 15 countries, including in Sweden and in the Netherlands, um, and has been used in a range of other European and non-European countries as well. Um, so the development of this tool is described in academic journals and um, the tool itself, as I say, is widely used. So what we did here is we asked children to tell us do you do any of the following tasks? And from that, we're able to determine, because there are subscales within this, whether they do a lot of intimate care, whether they do a lot of emotional and supervision care, and so on. In the 2010 survey, of the 4,000 pupils that we surveyed, we discovered that 8% of those pupils were involved in personal and intimate caring tasks, dressing, washing, and showering. And so what we said from that survey was that at least 8% of children who were self-identifying as young carers. We only used that figure. We didn't look at the um, other figures around emotional support and stuff like that. We simply went for the closest proxy indicator to being a young carer. And we said in this survey that if a child was involved in intimate and personal care for a parent with an illness or disability, then we would count them as a young carer. And that figure came out at 8% of all children were young carers. And that equates to 700,000 children. That's four times more than the census revealed because the census revealed about 2.3% and this method revealed that it was 8%. In 2018, we repeated the same exercise, but this time with a slightly different age group, aged 11 to 15, and 925 pupils. Um, this was a representative sample. Um, so we had done um, all the sampling to ensure that this group of 925 children were representative of the wider sample of children aged 11 to 15. And what we discovered this time round was that 22% of all of these pupils had a caring task. Again, this is self-disclosure. They filled in the MACA, that self-assessment tool, and we discovered that 22% said that they had one or other caring role. And that equated to 2 million young children in the United Kingdom. And that's 12 times more than the census revealed. 
So what we have here is a picture that when you ask children directly, you get a very different figure, a much higher figure than when you ask parents whether their children are carers. And I'll give you one final illustration of that point. In Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, in the 2016 census, um, they asked the head of the household, the adult, to tell them whether there were any young carers. And what they found in that census was that 3,800 children under the, age of eight, uh, under the age of 15 were young carers. And they had done a census in 2011 and they found a drop in numbers, but they still found that of these 3,800 carers under the age of 15, 79% were providing up to two hours of care a day. The average was 16 hours a week or 2.2 million hours of care per year by this small group of children under the age of 15. So that was their census. But in 2018, the Irish government did, it, did something which I had suggested, which is that they asked pupils directly whether they had a caregiving role. So instead of relying on adult completion, they asked pupil completion. And they didn't use the MACA, they used another set of questions. But what they found out by asking children directly was that 13% of young people 10 to 17 reported a regular caring role, which equated to 67,000 young carers. And what they found from this survey was that young carers were reporting poorer outcomes, lower life satisfaction, poorer mental health, being bullied, and indeed one quarter were going hungry to school or going hungry to bed. So the important point that I'm making here is that the Irish census and the Irish health behavior in school children survey show very different results. The census shows one figure, the sense that the school behavior um, self refer self completion survey shows another, and it's much, much higher when you ask children directly. So what I'm saying to you is this, if you want to know the real number of young carers in Finland or any other country, don't rely on their parents. Um, you must also ask children directly. So what does that mean for countries around Europe? Well, it means that in different countries, we have different proportions. So in the UK, the official figure you can see here is two to 3% from the census. But from my figures, it's anything between 8% to 22%. In Norway, it's 6%, Australia, 4%, Sweden, 7%, Italy, 3%, Switzerland, 8 to 10%, Netherlands, 10%. And we have different figures for different countries. If someone said to me, Saul, what is your best estimate of the extent to which young carers, uh, children are young carers in any particular advanced country, I would say to you that it is probably around eight to 10% of a population. Um, so in uh, Finland, I would guess that it would be around eight to 10%. I can't imagine that you're very different with due respect to the proportion in Sweden. Um, or the Netherlands, um, Norway, et cetera. I'm sure there are differences, but I think it will be in that kind of figure, um, the extent of caring amongst children. The second finding I want to talk about is the, the people who receive care. Um, and the people who receive care are often parents and grandparents, and they often have more than one condition. There is comorbidity, mental illness and physical disability, and so on. Let me show you the evidence. <clears throat> so in the 2018 BBC survey that I mentioned before, where children are self-completing, we found that 46% were caring for their mothers, and then siblings and fathers and grandparents, and a third were caring for more than one person. We also found that the um, difficulties of the people who were being cared for, a third, 35% was physical disabilities, a quarter was mental illness, and then long-term illness. But we also had children caring for parents and other family members with learning disabilities, with drug misuse, and with alcohol problems. 
The third finding I want to talk about is that young carers are providing many hours of care a week. <clears throat> Some people have said that young carers must only be doing one or two hours a week, and it's not really very difficult, is it? It's like tidying the house. And the data shows that that's absolutely not the case, that many children are providing many hours of care a week with very high levels of responsibility, including intimate and emotional care. Let me show you the evidence. In the 2011 census, because I don't have data for the 2021 census, what we found here was that you can see the breakdown of the amount of hours that children are caring. This is our official census statistics. And you can see that many young carers are providing one to 19 hours. So some young carers will be providing small amounts of caring. But again, we have figures for the uh, numbers of young carers who are providing 20 to 49 hours of care per week. And we also have figures for the numbers of young carers who are providing 50 or more hours of care each week. And you can see the ages of those children. So here, if we take five, six and seven year old children, you can see that there are 1,642 children age five, six or seven who are providing over 50 hours of care a week. This is effectively a full time job. And you can see that 1,100, are providing 20 to 49 hours. And again, you can see for all age groups. And what you can see here is that as the child gets older and older, they are doing more hours of care per week. The numbers uh, increase, but there is significant increase in the amount of responsibilities that children take as they get older in their families. That's an important finding because it tells us that families have expectations that as their children get older, they will take on more and more caring roles. So what this census data shows is that even according to parents and adults, a significant number of very young children are providing many hours of care per week. We know from a number of surveys that I've conducted with fairly large samples, the last one, with 6,000 young carers, um, that you can categorize the caring roles of children under a number of headings, domestic, that's cleaning, tidying, general and nursing care, giving medication, giving injections, dealing with prescriptions, etc., emotional support, which is supervision, intimate care, which is showering, uh, taking people to the toilet, feeding them, sibling care, which is looking after uh, younger brothers and sisters who have no illness or, uh, or condition, but whether a child is having to take on their care because their parents are unable to do so. And then other, which would include translation, where English isn't the first language, um, dealing with the household finances and so on. In our 2018 BBC survey, um, what we found then was by asking children directly, 10% of the children who were young carers told us that they were involved in personal and intimate care. And that included dressing the person that they were looking after, washing them, showering them, and so on. And 48% of the young carers, nearly half, were involved in emotional care, supervision, keeping the person uh, they care for company, keeping an eye on them, taking them out, helping them, being there, and so on. We also found that one third of our young carers in that 2018 survey were involved in high amounts of care and 9% of all the young carers were involved in very high amounts of care. And that's measured by the MACA. A MACA score of over 14 indicates a high amount and a MACA score of over 18 indicates a very high amount of caring. The fourth research finding relates to the, to the young carers' transitions to adulthood, to college, to higher education, university, to paid work, and into independence, their own lives, um, independent of the person that they've been caring for. And what this body of research for 30 years tells us 
is that transitions to independence and adulthood are very complex and problematic for young carers because they receive little focus support and the outcomes are that they will experience a range of inequalities and disadvantages. This isn't for every young carer, but this is an average profile. Some young carers, like me, will go on to be professors. Some will become vice chancellors. Some will become social workers and experts. But many will find that their trajectories and pathways to university and to a good paid job are made much more problematic by long-term caring, which might have impacted on their childhood, their education and their life chances. Let me show you the evidence. I did two studies on transitions in 2000 and 2008, growing up caring and young adult carers in the UK. And what we found from these studies was that many young carers care right throughout their childhood. It isn't just something that they do for a week or two. This is something that continues throughout childhood or for long periods of childhood, and that they will continue caring into adulthood. And that's why we have the phrase young adult carers, because if you stop researching and providing services to children who are young carers and then simply stop working with them at the age of 18, you find that they haven't stopped caring at 18. Their caring continues into 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and beyond. And so what we realized was that we needed to extend our focus, not just on young carers up to 18, but beyond 18 into their 20s, and maybe even beyond that into their 30s. But we've constructed this group of children who are young adult carers up to the age of 24 to show that the transition from being a young carer who, physic who formally stops being a young carer at 18, doesn't, it doesn't mean that they stop caring. And so we're interested to know the outcomes of caring for children or young people in their 20s as well, hence young adult carers. We found that many young carers had very little support in their transitions from childhood to adulthood, that young carers projects didn't really, stopped providing a service at 18. And now we have hundreds of young adult carers projects in the UK because of my research who work with young adult carers 18 to 24, because now we realize that they haven't just stopped caring. We found that schools were not supportive, that universities didn't know what to do with young adult carers who came to college or to university, and that people were finding it very difficult to transition into the paid labor market. In my 2013 survey, which is a one we haven't talked about just yet, but it's a survey of 14 to 25 year olds, all of whom are carers. Um, we looked at just under 300 young carers who were at school, college, in work, or not in education, employment, or training. NEAT means not in education, employment, or training. They're, if you like, falling outside the system. And this really helps us understand from young carers' own points of view, their transitions through to college, university, or work. We found that of this sample of just under 300 young carers, they started caring at 10, the age of 10, and Whilst, and when we looked at the young carers still at school, half were saying that they were enjoying school, 78% said they were doing well, um, although um, half had no recognition of their caring role at school. And many, a quarter, were saying they were bullied. 92% of those children said they would love to go to university, but a quarter said, I don't think we can afford to go. So there was aspiration to go to university. When we looked at the young carers who were at college or university, 79% said they were really enjoying college or university. 69% said they were doing well. A third had chosen to go on a course that was related to caring, nursing, social work, or whatever. 
46% said that they were not recognized or helped at all by college or university. Those colleges and institutions didn't know that they were a young carer. And 16% said that they may have to drop out because they weren't able to combine their studying and learning with caring. In fact, when they got to college at uni or university, 29% dropped out and 56% said they were experiencing difficulties because of their caring role. It was hard to manage uh, college or university. So young carers now have become a real issue in the UK for schools, for colleges, and for universities. How do we ensure that young carers can go through school in a positive way and have an equal and fair chance to get to university? So that's an issue of access. But how, when they're at university, can they combine studying and caring so that they can complete their degrees and do well, rather than 29% having to drop out? We've been able to calculate roughly what that means in terms of lost days and absences for children at different stages of their lives. And you can see here that we've estimated that at school, a quarter of all days are affected for young carers and 5% of school days are missed when a child is a young carer at school. By the time they get to college and university, three days per month are missed. And by the time they get into the paid labor market, 17 days per year are lost because of caring. So we can see that the caring role not only has an impact in terms of lost time at school, but if you like, casts a shadow forward straight into employment as well. The fifth set of findings relate to the outcomes of caring, being positive and negative, including large numbers we have now discovered who have mental health difficulties of their own. So we've talked for 30 years about the negative outcomes, restricted friendships, stigma by association if your parent has HIV and AIDS or mental illness or drug or alcohol misuse, the fear of interventions in case you're brought into, the, into care, silence, secrets, emotional problems. We've also talked about some of the positives for young carers that they get a sense of responsibility, of maturity, they develop skills, they have some control over uh, what's going on in their family. There's an issue about whether they're developing resilience through all of these difficulties. And um, so there is a positive and negative mix of outcomes. And another psychometric instrument that we've designed, the PANOC, the Positive and Negative Outcomes of Caring psychometric instrument measures the um, positive and negative outcomes for children using a 20 item self-completion scale, which is also used in 15 countries, including Sweden, um, the Netherlands and Norway. We've, when we did our 2013 survey, we asked the 300 young carers whether they had any illnesses or disabilities of their own. And shockingly, 45% self-reported that they had some mental health problems because of their caring role. And 25% said dyslexia, 21% said physical disabilities and so on. This 45% of young carers self-disclosing that they had mental health problems was such a surprising and shocking figure that it led to us putting in a bid to Horizon 2020 um, to do a study of the mental health of young carers in six European countries, Switzerland, Sweden, the UK, the Netherlands, Slovenia, and Italy. And this study looked at the uh, young carers aged 15 to 17 to give a profile of who they are and the outcomes of caring on their own mental health and on their lives. It's called the Me We Project, and there is a dedicated website um, um, that you can access. Um, simply type in me, we, young carers into Google or whatever, and you will find the website. What we found here is that we had nine and a half thousand participants, of which 2,099 were adolescent young carers aged 15 to 17, the group we were interested in. 
and we could see who received care. It was a, uh, family members, mums, dads, grandparents. 16% were caring for more than one family member. 53% of all young carers were, were caring for a close friend and 22% were caring for a family member and a friend. And grandparent care was the highest in Italy. In Italy, 72% of the people being looked after are grandparents, not parents or brothers and sisters. And we can see the profile of the, of the health conditions. Physical disabilities, 46%, mental illness, 40%. And in the UK, that was 57% of the people receiving care had mental health problems. And in Italy, it was 18%. And we can see a whole profile of here of um, what were the needs of the people who received care. But we also discovered by doing a number of, using a number of tests and instruments, what the impact of caring was on children themselves. And we discovered that the higher the level of caring, in other words, the more caring a child was doing, that that was associated with more school difficulties, greater levels of bullying at school, and more mental health problems of the child themselves. This is really strong evidence that the more caring a child does, the more likely they are to have school problems, be bullied and have their own mental health problems. So for example, 36% um, said that their mental health had actually deteriorated. 19% were saying that their school performance was negatively affected. And that ranged from 14% in some, the lowest country to 41% of children in other countries. 17% overall were bullied. 41% of young carers in the UK are bullied. 16% said that they had thought about hurting themselves, ranging from 9% in one country to 31%, and 7% said that they had thought about hurting others. This is the first time ever that we have now got data on the proportion of children in six European countries who have thought about hurting themselves, deliberate self-harm, or hurting other people, including the person that they're caring for. Let me move now onto the final block, if you like, which is what are the concepts that we've learned from 30 years of research? We know that children become carers for a combination of reasons. Some of those are cultural, many of them are about relationships and also structural issues. So we know that because the child lives in a family where there is illness or disability or mental health or whatever, and there is a, a bond of family love um, um, and attachment, that children are drawn into a caring role. But we also know that in some families that might be girls or some families it might be boys. It will depend on the structure of the family and whether there are multiple children or whether there is only one child. And if and that leads to many boys having to do very intimate care for mothers and many girls having to do intimate care for fathers if there is no other child of the same gender as the person who needs care. But we also know that there are structural issues here that poverty is a big factor. Many of these families are low income families. We also know that there is no alternative to children providing care in some families because they simply cannot afford to pay for anyone else to do it. So it's a combination. And in any family, it will be some mixture of these different factors that explains why a particular child has become a carer. Another concept that we have learned is a continuum of children's caring. So we know that on the left hand side, we have all children and all children need to care about family members. They need to care about strangers. And it's quite normal and quite routine for all children or to be providing routine levels of care to families and other people. But as children move across this continuum, um, they are increasingly taking on more and more responsibilities. They're increasingly doing more and more caring. It's becoming more complex, more time involved, more intimate, etc. And so you move from a situation where children are caring about family members to a situation where they're caring for 
family members and have high levels of responsibility and substantial and regular caring. And it's this group who are caring for that we call young carers and young adult carers. And it's this group where there is evidence of significant negative outcomes. Our job as professionals and practitioners is to embrace the fact that all children should care about, but to try and prevent children moving more and more into this category of caring for. So what's our task? Our task is to stop children becoming profoundly vulnerable or to move children who are young carers from being in a position of vulnerability. That's providing inappropriate care, excessive care, having their education affected, their well-being affected, their life chances affected, their senses of isolation, etc. And we need to move them to a position of growth, to learn, to thrive, to achieve, to be protected, to enjoy childhood, to feel supported, to be identified as young carers so that they can be assessed and so that they can be supported correctly and appropriately and so that they can flourish. Agnes Liu and I have done a classification of a number of countries to see where they are in terms of their responses to young carers. And the first category one, which is a sort of really sustained um, reaction, uh, sustained policy response and legal response. There are no countries that are in that category, but the UK has been doing this work for 30 years and it has specific legal rights for young carers, lots of policies and practices, codes of practice for social workers, for teachers and so on. And various countries have fallen into this category at various stages. Most countries in the world though are in category seven which is no awareness of young carers and no response yet to this particular issue. My final slide is what do we do? So to move forward, we do need greater awareness of young carers and young adult carers by governments, by policymakers, by social workers and other professionals. We know from 30 years of work that early interventions can prevent children children's caring roles becoming institutionalized and normalized within families. So the earlier we intervene, the better. And you saw from our own census figures, reported by adults themselves, that children as young as five were providing heavy amounts of caring. We need to intervene early to stop those children becoming institutionalized in a caring role, not just that will be five and six, that would cast forward into their 20s and maybe 30s. We can improve young carers' health and well-being through interventions by social workers, by healthcare professionals, uh, and by schools. Um, and we need to look at the needs of the whole family um, as well as children. We need to assess children who are carers so that we can develop responses and, uh, and interventions that are appropriate and we need of course to do more research and evaluation um, as we go along. That's all I want to say. I'm conscious I've gone a bit over. My apologies for that. I hope that you found that useful. I hope I wasn't too quick. I've tried to slow myself down and it was just to say that I'm editing a special issue of a journal called Environmental Research and Public Health um, and it's all about young carers research policy and practice and if, for, if by any chance uh, Sam's or any of you are involved in research around young carers in Finland or anywhere else, and you would like to submit an article which will be collecting together research-based pieces, but also policy and practice-based pieces around young caring, please do contact me at that email, sb2516 at CAM, University of Cambridge, and I'll be able to support you in thinking through what that article might look like. But it would be wonderful if you're involved in research to have something from you. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Okay, that's a really good question. 
and I'm really glad you asked it. So when, so I have to go back a, a few years, if you don't mind. In 1995, I wrote a publication, a research report called Young Carers in Europe. And it was based on research I'd done in, Swiss, uh, in Sweden, uh, France, and the UK and Germany. And when my researcher went to Sweden, they said to him, um, there would be no young carers in Sweden at all because of our welfare state. And, um, and we found young carers very quickly. When I went about 15 years later to Sweden to do a big conference, um, it was a, and some of you may have been there, I, there was an audience of about 500 people. And I asked the audience um, um, whether they felt that there would be any young carers in Sweden because you've got such a good welfare state. And some people said, no, it's impossible for a Nordic Scandinavian country to have young carers because our welfare system is so good. And we know it's good. So I'm not denying that you have the most um, progressive welfare systems um, in the world, particularly if you compare them say to their insurance-based systems like in America and some other countries. Um, so the model of the Scandinavian Nordic welfare state is well known to me. Um, so people said in, in Sweden, no, we won't have any young carers, uh, it's not possible. And so then I presented data um, which suggested that there would be young carers and that that figure might be anything around five or six or 7% of all children. And then I basically said that would equate to a particular number. And, and I think Sweden recognized then, and they have done through the Me We project and through the work of uh, Elizabeth, um, at Linnaeus University, um, that there are young carers in Sweden. There are young carers, as you know, in Norway, and you've got Barnes Best in Norway that works with young carers. There are young carers in the Netherlands, and there are young carers in Finland. Um, um, so the welfare state that a country has is important. It is um, important because it gives a framework for the protection of children and safeguarding their health and well-being, but it does not prevent children becoming young carers. Um, and no welfare system, unless it became a totalitarian regime in which children were not allowed to care, um, could stop children from caring. Because actually, many young carers, as I showed you in that continuum, want to care. And it's important that all children are allowed to express caring, not just as an emotion, but as an act for family members and for strangers. Um, what I'm simply saying to you is that the danger is when that caring becomes so much, so institutionalized and so normalized that a child can see no way out of caring and the parent expects the child to care, irrespective of the da damage that does to a child's education, to their health and well-being. So I'm so pleased that that question was asked. Welfare states are critical. You, you have, seriously, I'm in awe of some of the Scandinavian welfare uh, initiatives, um, but it doesn't prevent children from caring, and we would be misguided and deluded to think that a good welfare state will prevent all young caring. Yeah, uh, Jonna, you have a question. Oh, well, I have some comments at least. Uh, I'm Jonna Skand and uh, I've been working um, for young carers in Finland since 2017. And I was there in, in uh, I think it was in Malmö maybe. Oh, <laughs> yes, the international conference. Uh, and I've been working very closely to Malla Heina uh, a, a close collaboration with her uh, around it, these things, um, and uh, and we had a meeting. We we both um, are members of a Nordic network for children next of kin and uh, young carers, and uh, Vans Beste um, are also a member of that same 
network. Uh, so um, you're absolutely right. Uh, our social welfare system does not prevent any any children from uh, becoming uh, children children as next of kin, uh, first of all, and then some of them are also young carers and some of them are young carers and they are all right. And some of them are carers, uh, young carers and they are not. <laughs> and as you said, uh, our, our aim and um, what we have to do is really to find those that are not all right, to identify, to listen, to support. Um, and, um, and one of the things we're doing here today is, um, uh, raising the awareness that uh, that we we have uh, young carers and we know we do, um, but but the, the, I think that the our uh, our welfare system is good, as as you said, but um, it also um, makes um, how shall how shall I say we have a child protection program and system that is on paper really good, but it's also something that young uh, that families and children are uh, afraid of. They they fear the interventions from the child protection, and uh, and and they they combine it with uh, moving away, like you you get um, you get how do you say you you you're not allowed to, to live with your family anymore. And that, and they think that that is the only um, solution the child protection uh, system has. And that is not true, but that is what's found in the media. And, and I must say that the first time I heard about young carers was uh, at Eurocarers, um, a Eurocarers meeting 2015 maybe. And I didn't, hadn't heard the meeting, because I've been involved in Eurocarers also for quite many years, and um, and as um, and as the first time I saw some young carers was at a meeting in in Brussels, and when I sat there as I me mean, having a, a a background as a school counselor, some of the pupils I've had were coming back to me, uh, like well that was one thing, well that must have been what what it was all about. And I didn't understand it then, and I didn't have the words to describe um, what it what what it what it was all about. And that is what we are doing now. I mean, we have we have we don't have we have um, both in Swedish and in Finnish words for this. Uh, we call them ungamsasjevare or nuoret hoivajat, but we don't. It's not commonly spread. It's not so that. A young carer in Finland would know that if I say that you're a young omsoisivare or might, you might be a young omsoisivare, that that person would even understand what it's all about. Probably not. That was my comment. Thank you. So everything you said, I agree with 100%. Everything you said is the same in the UK and every other country. Mm -hmm. um, so when I have done sessions with uh, psychiatrists, with social mm. workers, with teachers, mm. with nurses, with GP, uh, general practitioners, doctors. Um, when the light bulb goes on and they have the language about young carers and they, they then say, oh my gosh, I now mm. recognize that that pupil must have been a young carer. Mm. Or, and with the, 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 the most shocking one for me, in all honesty, was the psychiatrists when the lights go on. Mm. Because the psychiatrist said to me, um, oh my gosh, that boy that I saw for six months must have been a young carer. And that, that really shocked me because I thought, mm. what were you talking about then for those six months? If it's only now that you recognize. So for some reason, those caring conversations must not have come out very much in that. But it, what we, by, because I've been doing it for 30 years, um, I find that when I go and do, give talks in different countries, it does ray, it does switch the light on for many people, you know, that there are young mm -hmm. carers and that they have worked with young carers. So they think they never knew a young carer. And then they realize, actually, we did know a young carer, but we didn't identify them as such. 
And I think you're absolutely right that what we need to do is we need to be able to identify young carers who want to be identified. If a child does not want to be identified, I think there's a real issue there, unless there is a child protection safeguarding issue. Mm. So mm. some children should have the right to privacy, just like any person. Um, and indeed, if you look at the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, these right, I think the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is a good framework for what we should do for mm. young carers and with young carers. But everything you said, um, I identify with and, and agree with. And thank you for saying it. Thank you. We still, uh, we have one question here in the chat box. I can read it. Is there any difference in caregivers' family backgrounds? If the family have immigrant backgrounds, for example, I was thinking that, for example, in Sweden, where they have more immigrants than Finland has, and that would maybe be a reason that they would have maybe more young caregivers. That's a really good question again. Thank you. So, um, so on the whole, we, we know that young, there are children who are young carers in immigrant families. Um, we know that um, uh, asylum seeking families, migrant families, um, will have young carers because of the trauma that many families have gone through seeking asylum. And so children are taking on a caregiving role for parents and for other brothers and sisters because all the family has experienced trauma. But you know, there's another group of children that people don't realize are young carers because there's only a few articles which is fam children living in families where there is domestic violence. Because in those families, if you look, it's mostly in the United Kingdom um, families where the woman, um, the female is experiencing domestic violence. It's rare, it, it occurs in some families that the man, but it's predominantly domestic violence against women. And where there are children, research that I've looked at, well, I supervised has shown that some of those children are involved in direct young caring type roles for a mother who needs protection. And so they will be involved in emotional support, being there, supervising, being emotionally available. Sometimes they're involved in absolutely direct protection where there is a violent act about to be committed or is being committed, children will step in to try and stop it or to prevent it. And many children are involved in dialogue with the mother about the future. And so all of those kinds of things that children, some children are doing in families where there is domestic violence could be categorized as being in the domain of young caring. So the issue about migrant families is an interesting one. And yes, there are more um, migrants in Sweden um, and in other countries, but we are not discovering that that has increased the proportion of young carers in that country disproportionately. So it's not, so when I said to you, if you want to know what the proportion of young carers in Finland will be, I said to you that it'll be anything around seven to 10% of all children. If you had millions of migrants, it might be 11 or 12% or whatever but you don't so it's not going to change the proportion disproportionately just because of the way that population distributions um, take place but certainly migrant children but actually if you think about the background to many families they are usually lower income families and that will happen in the indigenous home population not just in migrant families because they're usually relying on disability benefits or disability services provided by the welfare state, um, whether they be health or social care or by voluntary or charitable organizations or a combination of state, voluntary sector and maybe even private. So it's more likely to be low income. It's more likely to be families where there is illness or disability or mental health or comorbidity. In some families, smaller amount it will be a background of alcohol and drug misuse which has led to children having to take on a caring role for parents and in some severe cases there will be child protection issues there 
in families where mental health delusions are so big and so strong that children are being brought into the delusional behavior of parents because of schizophrenia or other enduring mental health problems, then there may be a child protection risk. But on the whole, the migrant status of families is not the big issue. It is the, it is the prevalence or evidence of disability, comorbidity, low income and family structure. From the research we've done in the MeWe project in the six European countries, it is clear that girls take on more caring roles. Um, and it is clear that um, the impact on girls in certain aspects, uh, depending on which instrument you use to measure, whether it's physical health, mental health, education, can be more severe. But the key thing to, so I agree with you, but the key thing to remember is that um, in a family where there is only a son, there are no daughters, um, that son, will have no choice if the family expects him to do the care. Um, so what you say is absolutely right, where there are a few children of which there is a girl and a boy. Um, but I talk in, about the concept of what I call election, a child being elected into a caregiving role. And in some families, that will be the girls because they are seen as natural carers and the whole way our world is organized to push women, girls and women into certain roles and responsibilities. But in other families, a boy will be pushed into that because there isn't a girl. And in some families, a boy will be pushed into that role rather than the girl because the boy is seen as potentially more capable of providing the care than the girl. So your level of analysis, your, your point is a really important point at the level of the structural analysis, but at the level of the individual family, um, sometimes um, it, it, it doesn't work like that, but it is a very important point. 